Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Stephanie. I'm a speech language pathologist here. So we're going to start uh, the presentation today just talking about swallowing difficulties in the neuromuscular populations. So we're going to talk about first just what speech language pathology is. Um, so we work to prevent, assess, diagnose, and treat speech, which is um, things like articulation, how our voice sounds, uh, things along those lines. Language, which is are things like grammar, how our sentences come together, social communication, um, you know, are you being socially appropriate when you're talking to someone, talking too close, those sorts of things. Cognitive communication um, are the other areas that affect communication, like memory, organization, not necessarily language itself, but things that can affect when you're having a conversation with someone, and then swallowing disorders. So within the neuromuscular clinic, we're available to help with all of these uh, areas, but we most often find that we're working um, with people with swallowing impairments. And so that's what we're going to focus on the presentation today. Uh, but if you do have uh, areas of concern in, or concern in the other areas, then um, feel free to speak to your physician and request a consult because we do um, work with people with the speech and language issues as well, and we can help with that. So swallowing impairment, uh, also known as dysphagia, you may hear from time to time. There are three stages of the swallow. The oral stage, which is when food or liquid is in your mouth. The pharyngeal stage, which is when it's in your throat. And the esophageal stage, and that's that tube that runs uh, to your stomach. So uh, areas of impairment can in occur in any of these stages. Uh, so for example, with your mouth, difficulties can include chewing, uh, food being left in your mouth after you've already swallowed, um, and people may find that they're avoiding tough textures when they have difficulties in this area. The throat, so difficulties with the throat can include um, feeling like food or liquid is staying behind in your throat after you've swallowed, like that sticking sensation. Um, so that might cause you to swallow multiple times. Um, coughing, choking, that all occurs in the throat area. And then the esophageal stage, or the, the third stage, that's that tube to the stomach. Um, typically, what we find people tell us when there's an issue in that stage, they find they have uh, reflux, regurgitation of food, um, or things sticking a little bit lower, like typically in the chest area. We don't actually assess that area, we just screen for issues in that area, and then we refer on to the appropriate uh, sources if there are issues in that area. But definitely something you can bring up to us, and then we can refer on to the, the correct people to deal with that problem. So if some of these things sound familiar to you, um, there are lots of things that we can do to assess and potentially treat and manage uh, these problems. So let's talk about some of the common signs and symptoms of a swallowing impairment and when, obviously, to know when to contact uh, your physician or a speech language pathologist. So the most obvious ones are coughing and choking when you're eating or drinking, or wet voice, throat clearing, and sensation of sticking like we were talking about before. So the airway is uh, right in front of the esophagus, or that tube that runs to your stomach. So sometimes, uh, if there's issues with the muscles or the timing of the swallow or, or uh, lots of other things, um, sometimes that liquid or solid can go down the wrong tube, is what people usually say. It's gone down the wrong tube. And that happens to everyone once in a while. But when it starts happening more frequently, um, starts affecting uh, your eating habits or your weight gain or anything like that, then uh, that's when it becomes an issue. So coughing is obviously, everybody has uh, knows what coughing sounds like. Choking, technically choking uh, only occurs when you are eating solids because it will obstruct the airway, it'll block that airway and then that's when you actually have choking. Wet voice uh, typically happens after liquids. So if a liquid ends up going down the wrong tube and it hits the, your vocal folds, that wet voice comes out because the vocal folds are vibrating and causing, it, uh, causing that liquid to vibrate as well. Lots of throat clearing is basically the same thing. Uh, usually it can be uh, solids or liquids with throat clearing, and it's just your body's way of trying to push whatever's in there out. 
And then a sensation of sticking. There are a couple areas in your throat where things can get left behind. So that's typically where that sensation of sticking comes from. Not always, but typically. Um, other issues can be prolonged meal times, fatigue with eating. Um, some people already start to um, change their diet and what they're eating and their eating habits. Uh, and these are common signs too that are a little bit more subtle uh, that there's an issue happening. So prolonged meal times uh, is one of the more subtle signs. Um, if you're taking more than 30 to 45 minutes to eat, then that could be a, an issue. Uh, and we can help adapt your diet so we can help you find um, an easier texture to reduce that time it takes to eat. Really um, associated with that is fatigue with eating. So if you're feeling exhausted at the end of a meal, you're too tired to finish eating, goes hand in hand with those prolonged meal times, and then typically we see the weight loss and issues like that. Uh, we can, if you're finding that you're changing where you're eating, like if you're not eating out in public, that can be an issue. We can help figure out what's going on and how to help with that as well. And if you're already finding that you're avoiding tougher textures and you're still having an issue, then we can help with that. Signs and symptoms. So aspiration pneumonia, this is the, the biggest one. So if you're having pneumonias that just keep coming back and you can't figure out what that is, um, sometimes that can be an aspiration pneumonia and that's a pneumonia specific to things going down the wrong tube. And that tube, the airway, runs to the lungs instead of the stomach. So that's where we get that aspiration pneumonia and that's that pneumonia that just usually, it doesn't have to, but it usually keeps coming back. Unplanned weight loss, we've talked about that a little bit already. Um, and respiratory changes. So if you're finding you're getting uh, really congested coughs a lot, that can be a sign. Uh, potential outcomes, there are lots of them. Um, it, it can be, it can range from anything from just a minor inconvenience, a swallowing issue, or there can be more serious outcomes from some of the complications from swallowing impairments, like choking or, or uh, aspiration pneumonia. Um, so these are the factors that can potentially be associated with uh, dysphagia, malnutrition, fear of eating, social isolation, decreased mental health status, aspiration pneumonia, increased morbidity, and increased mortality. So that's why it's really important to speak up if you're having any issues with swallowing um, and to have it monitored over time, especially if you're finding there's changes. So even if you've seen a speech therapist in the past, things change all the time. So it's, it's important to keep on top of that. So we've identified the potential concern in swallowing. What happens next? Uh, you should speak to your doctor and ask for a referral to come see us. There are many options for assessment and treatment in regards to swallowing impairment. Typically what we start with is the history and the bedside swallowing assessment. And that's really just talking to you, seeing what your issues are, um, things like how long it's been happening, what's happening to you. And then we'll do a quick oral motor assessment where we take a look at the muscles of your lips, your tongue, your mouth, see how things are working. Um, and then we would give you a little bit to eat and drink just in a normal room, just normal liquids and solids. Um, and just assess right there how things are going. If we find there are some major concerns, we might recommend further assessment, a more objective assessment. Uh, and these typically include modified barium swallow studies and fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing. So a modified barium swallow study is an x-ray video of the swallow. So we take you to uh, the x-ray department and we give you um, a little bit of barium mixed with the same regular foods and liquids that we would have given you at the bedside. Um, and we can see, it's a video, so it's fluoroscopy, we can see what's happening in your throat while you swallow. We see the side view on that one. Um, and we can see the airway, we can see if anything goes into the airway, what happens. We can also test um, different positions, different uh, textures at that time, strategies, see what works at that time to see if we can help figure out a way to manage. Uh, fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, also called FEES, um, is where we take a small camera and it goes up through the nose and into the back of the mouth. It just sits behind the tongue. And so we get a top-down view of the swallow. So we get to see, um, you would just eat and drink normally, and then we get to see uh, not the actual point of the swallow, but right before the swallow and right after the swallow because when we swallow, our tongue comes back and it blocks that camera. So we don't actually get to see the exact point of the swallow, but we do get to see residue left over, and we 
we typically um, use a food coloring and we can see into the airway. We actually get to a view of the airway. We can see if there's anything in there after the swallow. We can also see if there's residue. We can see um, if food or liquid is following down ahead of time. So also a uh, very important assessment for swallowing. And we can also try those strategies as well at that time too, the same ones. So treatment and management. There's four main areas, diet modification, compensatory strategies, environmental changes, and rehabilitative strategies. Because there's so much variability within and across neuromuscular diagnoses, uh, we can't really provide generalized um, advice around treatment and management just to everyone. Uh, everyone needs an individualized assessment uh, to determine which approach is most appropriate for that person. So because of this, we're just going to briefly touch on the options. The first one being diet modification. So this can include how you cook and prepare food. There are uh, about five different ways that we use here. Um, and everything from puree, which is completely smooth food with no lumps or anything, it's the easiest to eat, all the way up to a regular diet, which includes everything. So we have puree, we have minced or ground, where it's kind of like uh, ground beef texture or excelled sandwich. There's a, a soft diet option, which is mashable with a fork, but a, a little bit more formed than minced. And then there's an easy to chew, which we just cut out really hard things like uh, nuts and, and hard objects. And then obviously regular. Um, and then so we can um, help people figure out how to modify the diets. Um, and, and we can work with the dietitian to figure out how to get all the nutrition in on the modified diets. Um, for liquids, there's a couple of different options there as well. So if it's liquids that are your main problem, sometimes for some people, changing the um, thickness of the liquid can help with that. It gives you a little bit more time to close your airway for the swallow for some people. Um, so there are a couple different uh, thickness, liquid th uh, viscosities. Uh, nectar thick and honey thick are the two main ones. Um, but just know that it doesn't help everyone. Um, some people have other issues where there's residue being left over and those people it's not going to help as much. So it really is important to come in and, and be assessed to know what the right diet is because it's, it's not a one and all. Um, we also have resources for spouses or family members. We have the diet texture, we have handouts that explains everything. We have handouts on tips and general tips and we will, once we assess you, we will add more specific strategies for you in combination with the dietitian recommendations. And we can also help you find um, places to buy modified food or have it uh, delivered, whatever the need is. Uh, compensatory, so compensatory strategies are, are things like different positions. Sometimes when we change your head position, it will change the flow of the food or the liquid. And for some people that may help depending on their issue. So there are some that are like that. Environmental, there are um, adaptive tools such as metered straws that only let out a little bit at a time. So if that's an issue where the flow is too fast, we can slow that down. There are, there are lots of different straws um, and there's also cups. There's, there's a lot of different um, adaptive uh, items out there that, that can help us. And then also uh, oral care. So oral care is really important also. Um, we want to reduce the amount of bacteria in our mouth because if that bacteria gets down into our lungs with the food or liquid that may be going down there, that really increases that risk of aspiration pneumonia. And so oral care, brushing with toothbrush, toothpaste is very, very important. And, and we recommend that for everyone. Rehabilitative strategies. So uh, there are some uh, swallow uh, exercises that are designed to improve swallowing function. It really depends on what issues we see and we always have to have an objective assessment. So either that modified barium swallow or fees to determine what the appropriate uh, swallowing exercises may be. They don't work for everyone. They're not always uh, indicated, so it's not really our go-to necessarily for swallowing um, 
exercises, but it is an option if we, if we see something that we feel may be improved um, or maintained, then that is always an option. So this has been a really brief overview of what we can do. It's a, it's a very complex problem often though, um, and there's just so much variation that we just wanted to give a brief overview of that. Um, so we hope that you have a general understanding of the signs and symptoms of swallowing impairment um, and that you can monitor and report to your doctor if you're, um, if you're worried about anything and then uh, a referral to a speech language pathologist can be made and we can go through the appropriate assessments and find uh, individualized assessment and treatment for you, management. So if you feel that this presentation related to you, just uh, request a referral from your physician so that we can determine the appropriate assessments and management options for you. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Tiffany, the dietitian with the Neuromuscular Clinic. And today I'm going to be talking about overview of nutrition basic macronutrients, so protein, fats, and carbohydrates, and I'm going to tie it up in the Mediterranean diet at the end. Next week, I'm coming back because we try not to talk too, too long, so there's still some more topics that I want to cover, which I'll cover next week, a bit more specific information related to bowels, which will overlap with what the nurse is going to be talking about. And then I'm going to go into some specific eating challenges. And then I'm also going to talk a bit about prednisone next week and then supplements too. Does healthy eating make a difference? Getting the right amount of nutrition will help your energy levels, your strength, and your overall health. The goal is to meet your nutritional needs while maintaining enjoyment of eating. So today I'm going to explore specific nutrients and their benefits to you throughout the presentation. Nutrition is very confusing. Do any of these diets look familiar? We hear many, many diets in the media, through our friends. So why is nutrition so confusing? First of all, part of the issue is that everybody thinks that they're an expert in nutrition. And we often get our nutrition advice and recommendations from family or friends or internet. If we search online or read social media, there's always something out there about nutrition. And it's easy to believe it if you hear, oh, this food is really bad for you, you shouldn't eat it. Of course you want to do what's best for yourself, so maybe you avoid that food or maybe you eat that food and think that you're not doing the right thing. The other issue is media will put a story out on a specific nutrition study that may get exaggerated and then people suddenly think, oh, I can't eat eggs because the study came out about how eggs are bad. But we don't draw nutrition conclusions based on one study. That's not good science. So one study comes out and then people draw a conclusion and then the food gets a bad reputation. Um, we have to decipher many different studies and lots of different types of evidence. And your best source for nutrition information is a registered dietitian. So if you have access to one through your clinic, if you come to the Calgary clinics, you can access me. That is my recommendation if you are confused about nutrition or if you are unsure about what your specific nutrient needs are. Ask your physician if you can get a referral to the dietitian. So I'm hoping by the end of the presentation, you're going to feel a little bit more confident about making some healthy food choices. And again, the goal is to maximize your nutrition within your individual unique lifestyle. First, I'm going to talk about protein. Protein is very important, has many roles in our body. It's important for our immune function. And it's also what transports many hormones, our vitamins and minerals and oxygen throughout our body. If you're not eating enough protein, your body will break down your muscle to get what it needs because it needs protein every day to function properly. So it's really important that you eat enough protein and spread it out throughout the day. Protein can also help control blood sugars. When we eat carbohydrates, they are released into our bloodstream quickly and give us fuel fast. Eating carbohydrates with protein helps to slow the digestion of it down and keeps that fuel lasting with us longer. Protein also promotes satiety. Satiety is another word for saying you feel full and satisfied. If you eat carbohydrates on their own, it's easy to keep eating and eating or feel hungry a short time after. Eating those carbohydrates with protein can help you feel satisfied longer. So people's protein needs are based on their weight. 
It could also be based on a specific medical condition you have or any, any stress that you might be going through. There's different variables that can affect your protein requirements. And if you're unsure, again, you can ask to speak to a dietitian. But typically what you want to do is aim for a source of protein with every meal and snack so that you are getting enough protein in throughout the day and, like I said before, spreading it out. So protein is in meat, fish, eggs, dairy, beans, lentils, nuts and seeds to a lesser extent. There is some protein there, but um, it's important to try to get some, at least one or more of those foods with every meal and snack that you eat. I'm just going to move from proteins into fats now. So this was one, this is one thing that sort of changed over the decades. Low fat diets were all the craze in the 90s. They really should be left in the 90s with tie dye shirts. So we now know that fat is important for us. We don't need to be choosing fat free foods. We, our bodies need fat. It is important to be mindful of the type of fat you're eating. And I'm going to explain that in a minute here. Um, fat is important. It makes us feel full. There's some as evidence that suggests it can be neuroprotective. And fat is an easy way to get some additional calories in your diet if you find you're struggling with maintaining your weight. So I mentioned the type of fats is important. We recommend aiming to choose what we call heart healthy fats. So these are the fats that are more liquid at room temperature and they're plant-based fats. They contain monounsaturated and polyunsaturated oils. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Saturated fats should be limited. They will, saturated fats will increase our LDL cholesterol. L is for lousy, that's the bad stuff. Um, saturated fats are found in animal products as well as coconut and palm oil. So any fat that's solid at room temperature is going to be mostly saturated fat. Trans fats should ideally be avoided altogether. Trans fats are in deep fried foods and anything that says hydrogenated or shortening in the ingredients list will contain a little bit of trans fat. This is just a chart that shows those different types of fats in different dietary fats. So I just want to point out a couple things on this. You can see the red lines indicates how much saturated fat is in something. So you can see down at the bottom, coconut oil and butter contain much more saturated fat than many of the other fats on this chart. Canola oil and olive oil have most that long yellow line, the light yellow, and that's the monounsaturated fat. So monounsaturated fat will increase your good cholesterol and it decreases your bad cholesterol. Um, the darker yellow is omega-3 fats. Omega-3 fats are a type of polyunsaturated fat and they have helpful anti-inflammatory effects. In Western diets, we eat way too much omega-6 so we, relative to our omega-3. So we're trying to increase our omega-3 fats for optimal health. Canola oil and flaxseed oil contain a lot of omega-3 relative to many other fats. Um, it's a different type of omega-3 than what you'd find in fish. So fish has an even better type of omega-3 fat and in order to get it you have to eat fish or if you absolutely cannot eat fish consider taking an omega-3 supplement but we do recommend trying to eat fish two to three times a week and unfortunately you have to choose a fatty fish so the plain white fish like cod or um, tilapia they don't have a lot of fat in them so it doesn't give you a lot of omega-3 fatty acids so if you can try to choose fish like salmon trout sardines herring a lot of people don't like that type of fish, but it's a very inexpensive way to get a good quality protein that gives you omega-3 and actually a lot of iron as well. Tuna contains some omega-3 too, so that's a good option that, you know, people who aren't big fish eaters, you can get tuna quite easily. So just moving from fats to carbohydrates. Carbs get a bit of a bad reputation. It's not because they themselves are bad, it's because the types of carbohydrates we eat aren't the best. 
So usually carbohydrate choices in Western diets are very low in fiber and high in sugar. So they're refined, they're not giving us the whole grain, they're not giving us all the nutrients that would be contained in the germ part of the grain or the bran part of the grain. And then there's lots of sugar or saturated fat added to them, like in the carbohydrates in this image. I'm going to talk about sugar a little bit more, but first I just want to talk about why carbohydrates are important for us. So as I mentioned earlier on, carbohydrates are our main source of fuel. It's the easiest way for our body to obtain fuel. So if you're feeling tired or fatigued, make sure that you're eating enough carbohydrates throughout the day. It's our brain's choice source of fuel. So it's what the brain uses easily for its fuel. Um, eating carbs on, its own, on their own, like I said earlier, will be digested fast. So I do recommend eating your carbohydrate with a protein. So for example, if you were to eat an apple for a snack, that may not last with you very long. If you can eat that apple along with a piece of cheese or a small handful of nuts, that will help to slow the digestion down of the apple and keep it lasting with you longer. Or you could do a banana with some peanut butter on top or some yogurt with fruit on top or vegetables dipped in hummus. Things that have both carbohydrates and protein. So I'm choosing snacks for examples because often people eat carbohydrate foods for snacks and then you miss out on some of those other nutrients. Carbohydrates are also a great source of fiber. When you're choosing bread, try to choose bread that is at least two grams of fiber per slice. And when you're choosing cereal, try to choose a cereal that's at least four grams of fiber per serving. So just a few slides about sugar. Sugar is um, abundant in our diets. The World Health Organization actually came out with recommendations in 2015 to reduce sugar in Western diets. And the World Health Organization usually comes out with the opposite. They come out with recommendations for world deficiencies, but sugar is becoming such a problem in our diet. So um, the recommendation is no more than 10 teaspoons for men, which is 40 grams of sugar, and no more than 6 teaspoons of sugar for women, which is 24 grams of sugar. You might be saying to yourself, there's no way I add that many teaspoons of sugar to my daily intake. The issue with sugar is that it's added in a lot of foods. So I'm just going to point out where you might find sugar in, in a common diet. So here's a large double-double. 30 grams of sugar. That's the same as six Oreo cookies. So, and if you're a woman, you're trying to get no more than 24 grams of sugar. So you can see how that could put you over just by making one food choice, the recommendation. So for the same amount of calories, more fiber, more protein, less sugar and fat, you can have a coffee with milk and a yogurt trifle made with Greek yogurt, fruit, and all brand cereal, which would be a well-balanced breakfast. A fruit muffin from Tim Hortons, although it contains five grams of fiber, it contains 36 grams of sugar, which is the same amount of sugar as eight Oreo cookies. So for breakfast, the same amount of calories, a healthier option would be a whole wheat English muffin with an egg on top, a small bowl of fruit salad, and a glass of milk. This is going to be a complete well-balanced breakfast. It will meet your protein, your carbohydrate needs, and get you started for the day with a nourished meal. Some granola bars have lots of sugar and some have more than this particular one, but um, this granola bar has 12 to 13 grams of sugar, which is three teaspoons of sugar, the equivalent of what would be in a Boston cream donut. Half of a cup of granola contains 20 grams of sugar, or five teaspoons, which is the same as a cup of Coke. So just pointing out that seemingly healthy foods can contain a lot of added sugar. So just take a minute to consider if you need to reduce your sugar. If you're trying to reduce your calories, it's an easy way to do that. If you're trying to keep your calorie intake the same, maybe you can reduce your sugar and replace it with more nutrient-dense foods. 
Sugar is what we call an empty calorie. It gives us calories, it doesn't make us feel full, it doesn't provide vitamins and minerals and protein. So if your weight is stable and you say, oh, well, I'm eating the right amount of food, but if you're consuming too much sugar, it's taking the place of what could be more nutrient-dense foods, giving you more nourishment. So this is my last bit about sugar. So um, just reading labels and inform yourself. The sugar content is always listed below the carbohydrate content. Four grams of sugar is a teaspoon. So if you read the label on something, you can figure out how much sugar it might add into your diet. Look out for added sugars in yogurt, granola bars, baking, sauces, and cereals. With yogurt, there will be a few grams of naturally occurring sugars that is fine. That's not considered an added sugar. That's part of a milk product. So say the yogurt contains 14 grams of sugar, maybe you subtract three or four and then it's got 10 grams of added sugar, just to give you a comparison. Just a quick note about fruits and vegetables. They increase our fiber, which helps us to feel full, keeps that food lasting with us longer. It also helps to lower our cholesterol and keep our blood sugars controlled. Fruits and veggies are a huge source of potassium in our diets. They help us to cut back portions of grains and meats if we need to do that. Huge source of antioxidants, and the antioxidant is actually in the pigment of fruits and vegetables. So try eating different colored fruits and vegetables throughout the day so that you get a variety of antioxidants. We do recommend trying to get one dark green and one dark orange fruit or vegetable every day. Of course, it adds color to our food and they taste great. So I'm just going to move on to the Mediterranean diet because it's a really good example of how you can apply some of this overall basic nutrition stuff into a style, an eating pattern. And um, the Mediterranean diet has been studied quite a bit recently. It's based on the eating habits of those living in the Mediterranean region. They also may have lower stress levels and higher activity levels but they've studied the diet specifically and seen that it helps to reduce chronic conditions, um, your risk of chronic diseases, it can help with inflammation, and it also might be neuroprotective. There's a lot of information on this slide. I brought with me today a handout on the Mediterranean style of eating that has this information, so if you want that, you can come grab the handout from me at the end of the session. But just basically for an overview of this style of eating, it recommends five servings every day of vegetables or more, three or more of fruit, five to six servings every day of whole grains. And that might sound like a lot, but a serving is only half of a cup of a cooked grain like rice or pasta, one slice of bread or three quarters of a cup of hot cereal, for example. So if you had a um, a cup of oatmeal in the morning, a sandwich with two pieces of bread, and a cup of pasta with supper, you would easily meet the five to six servings of whole grains in your diet. Also recommends using herbs, spices, garlic, and onion instead of salt to flavor food. And then one to three servings of milk and milk alternatives a day. This will help ensure that you're meeting your calcium requirement. And also, there's a bit of a focus on kefir and probiotic yogurt. And that's sort of a new area in nutrition. It's, it's not new. We've known about it for a long time. But you're going to see more about probiotics and the microbiome probably coming up in the next 10 years. But um, eating foods that help introduce that healthy bacteria into your gut has been shown to have good health implications. Kefir is very, very high in good bacteria. So a half a cup of kefir a day would be an easy way to introduce lots of that healthy bacteria into your gut. If you don't like kefir, or you're just a bit unsure about drinking fermented milk, you could consider a probiotic yogurt. So it does have to say probiotic on it to make sure there's enough of the healthy bacteria to survive your digestive tract. A regular yogurt that doesn't say it's a probiotic yogurt, it may not survive your digestion, and by the time it gets to your large intestine, the, there's no bacteria alive still. So you will see an example is Activia, or Olympic makes many probiotic 
types of yogurt. It will say probiotics somewhere on the label. Now that you're mindful of it, you'll probably notice it. Four tablespoons or more every day of olive oil. That's quite a bit. So that's just also thinking about how can you replace other fats, replacing butter on your toast or cooking oil with maybe you use vegetable oil or canola oil using olive oil. And then eating nuts, seeds, olives, avocado, three or more servings every week. There's another piece about it that didn't make it up onto the slide, but it's three or more servings every week of beans, peas, and lentils. These are what we call meat alternatives, and we're um, seeing more benefits of eating plant-based proteins. So they offer us soluble fiber, they're still a really good source of iron, it's a very inexpensive way to get good protein into your diet. So replacing some of the meat in your diet a couple times a week using beans, peas or lentils. Aiming for three or more servings of fish and seafood and then less than two servings a day of lean meat, which would be poultry and red meat. A serving of meat is the size of a deck of cards, just to put that into perspective. So this is an example of a diagram of your plate. Ideally, you want to aim for half of your plate as vegetables. Try to get two different kinds of vegetables, just so that you're getting a variety of vitamins and minerals. A quarter of your plate should be meat or the protein, and a quarter is the grain or your starchy carbohydrate food. Perhaps you have a glass of milk on the side or yogurt after and fruit. You could have that yogurt and fruit later as part of a healthy snack if that was too much food to eat at one meal for you. This is just to give you some practical suggestions if you wanted to implement some of the Mediterranean um, recommendations into your life. Here's some grocery list ideas. At least five different vegetables and at least three to four different fruit. So that is there because if you eat the same three or four vegetables or the same two pieces of fruit, it's hard to increase your intake of fruits and vegetables. Think about when you go to a buffet. We tend to overeat when we go to buffets because there's a large variety of foods. If you have a greater variety of fruits and vegetables in your home, you're likely to eat more of them. I also recommend trying to stick with what's in season. So this is a bit tricky for us, particularly for fruit, because right now we're looking at pears, apples, and bananas. Those are sort of in season right now. Navel oranges come in season around December or January and stay in season till springtime, which that's when we get more, much more fruit available to us. Frozen fruit is a good solution for the winter months. Frozen fruit and vegetables are flash frozen, so they maintain their <coughs> nutrient content. And then a couple other items on there that I just want to highlight, garlic, salmon, canned light tuna. If you eat tuna, I recommend choosing light tuna more often than white tuna. White tuna is also the albacore tuna. It's higher in mercury because it's high up on the food chain. So choose a light tuna, very low in mercury. They're very small fish. They don't accumulate very much mercury. I've got the kefir and probiotic up there again. If you're new to kefir and you're interested in trying it, the brand Liberty makes a non-effervescent kind, so it's not fizzy. So often kefir can be fizzy and that might be off-putting for some people. Liberty's is just a smooth drink and it's quite nice actually. It's fairly palatable. I put quinoa on there because that's another type of a grain. If you eat rice, consider replacing it with quinoa. Quinoa contains much more protein than rice and it has fiber, whereas white rice doesn't contain any fiber. Steel cut oats, um, that is an easy way to get more soluble fiber in your diet and they look more like how that food looks in nature. Breakfast cereals are processed quite a bit, so the grain doesn't really look like how it looks like in nature. If you like the idea of steel cut oats, consider trying to cook them in a rice cooker add your oats, add your water and turn it on and it takes 15 to 20 minutes and you have a really nice breakfast that you don't have to worry about cooking on the stove top. You could even add a diced apple and some cinnamon to amp up the flavor.
And then red split lentils are the last thing there. If you've never cooked with those before, I encourage you to look up a recipe. Consider trying them in your diet. They cook up very, very fast, and they take on whatever flavor you add to them to cook with. So again, just some more practical suggestions. So just thinking of how you might change a couple of your habits. So instead of using ranch as a dip, consider using hummus. Instead of coconut oil or butter, olive oil. Butter on toast, use peanut butter. Peanut butter is very high in monounsaturated fat, and of course it's from a nut. Chips or crackers for a snack, consider doing fruit and some nuts. Instead of making a ground beef chili, you could try making a vegetarian chili with a variety of beans. Instead of a cream sauce, try the tomato sauce with olive oil drizzled on top. Steak, try a cedar plank salmon if you've never done one before. They're delicious. Again, you could Google a recipe. Fruit or vanilla yogurt, as you now know, it's very high in sugar. So consider a plain Greek yogurt with berries added on top. Greek yogurt's good because it's very high in protein. It's an easy way to increase your protein in a snack or at the breakfast meal. It's harder to get Greek yogurt containing probiotic though. So um, it's that balancing act. Maybe you get Greek yogurt in because you're trying to increase protein, or maybe you're not worried about protein and you choose a probiotic yogurt because you'd rather get the probiotics in. Instead of sour cream or mayo, try avocado. And then instead of white rice, try using wild rice or quinoa. Or there's many other grains out there, like barley, for example, is very high in fiber. And again, it looks more like how it would be in nature. So I talked about many different aspects of your diet today. Um, I recommend setting goals. We always learn new information. And I'm sure at these sessions you are learning a lot of information and maybe there's one or two very specific goals you could set for yourself to actually improve your lifestyle or improve your food intake. A small goal could be, I'm going to add one extra vegetable every day and that's all you work on. Maybe you don't work on overhauling all of your food intake or maybe the goal is half of my dinner plate is going to be vegetables or I'm going to add in half a cup of kefir every day. Just set a couple very small specific goals that ring true to yourself and then you'll actually be able to make change and be motivated perhaps to continue making further changes. So just in summary, ask a dietitian for trusted nutrition information. Eat protein throughout the day and every day. Choose healthy fats and don't be afraid to add fats into your diet. Eat whole grains, limit your sugar intake, and increase your fruits and vegetables. So if you want to learn more, I do, um, I collaborate with an occupational therapist and I do a cooking program downstairs in the wellness kitchen here eating well and conserving energy for people with neurological conditions I also do a living well on prednisone nutrition and side effects class in the new year I'm going to be doing a modified texture diet class with the SLP